Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome again to AP European History. Today we're going to take a look at politics in the age of progress. Now politics are really important because what we saw in some previous videos is that the second industrial revolution really changed how the whole system worked. And there were responses to that especially socialism, which challenged the way that, that uh, society worked. So the question is, how do governments respond to these different pressures? How do they respond to socialism? How do they respond to anarchism, the belief put forth by guys like Mikhail Bakunin that the uh, government should be eliminated altogether? mostly through assassinations, um, and how do they respond in some other countries to calls for increased democracy? Well, what we're going to see is that, yet again, there's a big split between the East and the West. And so we're going to take those uh, one at a time. So let's get started. So in the Age of Progress, there was this general idea that society was moving along for the better of everybody. And in Western Europe, this was far truer than in Eastern Europe, and governments found ways to respond to those changes. So let's start with Great Britain. Great Britain had it generally more peaceful than most nations. There, most of their people simply wanted more democracy, more of the vote. And so two major acts were passed in, the, in this period that would uh, account for that. The first is the passage of the Reform Act of 1884, which increased the number of people eligible to vote. The system was made even more democratic in 1911 when British Parliament members were, began to be paid. Now the change here is that you didn't have to be rich to be in Parliament because now you could draw a salary. The big problem that the English faced was in Ireland. Gradual reform like it happened in Britain was not going to do well in Ireland. Ireland really wanted to, to have some degree of self-rule and had been under British control for quite a long time. William Gladstone, the Prime Minister of Britain, tried to take on this situation by instituting land reform and even calling for some degree of home rule in Ireland where they would have a separate parliament but still be subject to English law. But none of this actually worked. Parliament wouldn't pass it and the conservative leaders fought against it. And so the Irish question was to simmer and be settled later. So on the whole, Great Britain saw a great deal of success in dealing with social pressures. The Irish question was still going to be out there and people were still going to have to deal with it. But in Britain, things were pretty good. Let's move on now to France. So France had a whole lot harder time dealing with this period. Napoleon III was gone after the defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. And there was a provisional government that was set up by the Germans. Now it was set to be Republican, but then you have these monarchists who try and elect uh, their representatives and it ends up in a big fight. The big fight becomes known as the Paris Commune, in which a group of people actually fought against the government uh, starting in April of 1871. Lots of women were involved in the fight and it ended up in a government massacre where 20,000 people were shot and about 10,000 people were exiled. Now this leads to some ongoing class anger in France. But the Republic keeps going and they set up a constitution in 1875 that, that, that establishes the Third French Republic. And the Third French Republic is going to keep going until World War II. Um, it actually lasts 65 years. One noticeable hiccup in the French Republic was the thing that became known as the Boulanger Crisis. A man named Boulanger was a military officer who really wanted to do away with the Republican government and he had the backing of his troops. Now, when they were ready to overthrow the government, he actually lost his nerve and committed suicide. So the French Third Republic continued on. But through it, schoolboys were taught that Alsace and Lorraine that had been lost in the Franco-Prussian War were territories that needed to be taken back. More on that later. So pretty much the story is that Western Europe, Britain and France were pretty successful in dealing with these challenges. But what about Eastern Europe? Well, now we're going to take a look at Germany, Austria-Hungary, and finally Russia. So on to Germany. Now in 1871, the German Empire had been declared with Kaiser Wilhelm I at the top of this. And despite the parliament, the, the Kaiser is still really in charge. 
Now, the problem is, even though they're unified, they're different leaders in the different states within Germany, and some of them even have their own armies. And so it's Bismarck that tries to grab hold of the monarchy and solidify their power. And he really does it through his culture kampf, his struggle for civilization. It was an effort really to take power away from the Catholic Church and give it to the state. And he also fought against the Social Democratic Party because he saw socialism as a threat to German nationalism. Um, he tried to make reforms with the Social Security law and increased suffrage, but through it all, they just didn't seem to work all that well. Well, when Wilhelm died, his son Wilhelm II came to power and didn't really like the, how the reforms were working. So he said goodbye to Otto von Bismarck, our friend, which proved to be a pretty bad decision. Okay, so the reality here is that if you get rid of the most brilliant political mind of his age, you're just asking for trouble. And you know, Kaiser Wilhelm II is going to find it, maybe in 1914. Now, further south, Austria-Hungary was dealing with the same problems they'd been dealing with for a long time. Lots of minorities. And the German-speaking side of Austria had been trying to maintain control. So the government decided to institute universal male suffrage. Now, this was great because it gave people the vote but it created a sense of nationalism inside of those minority groups in Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary in this period, hey, I'm going to go again with maybe not so successful because they're going to find that those minority groups having a little bit of say and wanting a little bit of nationalism might cause some problems in, I don't know, 1914? So finally, we come to the last of our countries, Russia. And after the murder of Alexander II, Alexander III undid all the reforms that his father had put in place. He expanded the secret police and pushed for an absolute power of the Tsar. Now this is going to turn a lot of people against him and it's going to lead to a lot of problems. And he passes those beliefs on to his son, Nicholas. Nicholas, well, more on him later. So Nicholas is going to have some problems of his own. Um, maybe in uh, 1914. I don't know. Maybe again in 1917. We'll see. Hey, anyway, look, the big picture here is that there's lots of changes going on in society in the late 19th century. And these different countries try to deal with them in different ways. And in the West, especially Britain and France, they tend to be fairly successful and end up with fairly stable countries. Whereas in the East, in Germany, in Austria-Hungary, and in Russia, the problems just keep mounting. And it's those problems which are eventually going to lead to something that, I don't want to give it away, might cost about 10 million lives. Anyway, more on that later. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you're enjoying this whole series. If you are, please subscribe so that you get any updates that I have. And if you have any comments or any suggestions or anything like that, please feel free to leave them in the comments field below. Until next time, my name is Paul Sargent and thanks for watching.